It's a series of farewell addresses from Moses to the people. He's dealt with them for many years, uh, but the Lord has promised him he will not enter the promised land. Uh, the people will and he will not. And so he's trying to give his final instructions. And it's not a book that is forgotten because if you'll go forward in the Old Testament, in Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they, they relied heavily on the book of Deuteronomy. And the theme of, of what they told the people was to remember the grace that gave you the land in the first place and the sin that got you kicked out and the covenantal love that is now bringing you back in. And so the Old Testament patriarchs relied heavily upon the book of Deuteronomy in the same way that we listen to the final words. You know, you see these lists all the time, uh, final last words of famous people. Generally, the last thing somebody says when they know they're dying, it's pretty important. It's what's really on their heart. And so what you have in Deuteronomy is Moses' heart towards the people. And when we get to chapter 4 and verse, uh, chapter 6, I mean, in verses 4 and 5, we have a, uh, two verses that are called the Creed of Israel by theologians. And basically, it begins a series of warnings against apostasy towards the people. And what we find is, in the book of Deuteronomy in particular, there is a theme. And if you were to start reading that book, you will notice over and over and over again that God, through Moses, is telling the people either to remember something or not to forget something. Over 17 times, you will find where God is telling the people, remember this or do not forget that. And so the real theme of Deuteronomy overall is that God is, is telling the people there's some things you need to remember. And they need to be so ingrained in you that you never forget them because there's a heavy punishment for forgetting. If you found the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, would you say amen? If you said amen or even if you didn't, if you would stand this morning as we read from the Word of God. We're going to start in, the, in verse 4, we're going to read through 12, and then we're going to skip down to 20. And the Word of God says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest in the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gate. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digs which thou digst not, and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware. Lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Skipping down to verse 20, it says, And when thou, son, askest thee in time to come, saying, What mean these testimonies and these statutes and these judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware our fathers. And then the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. I pray, Father, that you would give me uh, utterance today from on high. Lord, I've studied and I've read, Lord, and I've come up with so many things. But as I stand here, Lord, I realize that these, the people do not need clever words, Lord God. They don't need anecdotes. They need to hear from you, Father. I need you to help me, Lord God, to preach what you've put on my heart, Lord God. Preach it from a place... Deep within, through the Holy Spirit, let him give me utterance of word today that you might reach your people, Lord, to encourage them, to chastise them, to save them. Whatever it is that your work that needs to be done today, Father, we pray that it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
you'll have to forgive me my voice today. Against my wife's uh, advice, I mowed yesterday and I have allergies. And this morning, I can't breathe. My chest is completely clogged up. One of the things we need to remember, I'm going to be quick in the points today. Somebody say amen. If you believe that. One of the things that, that we need to do is we need to remember the deliverance. There are three things I believe in Deuteronomy that God really emphasizes. And one of those is that we need to remember our deliverance. If you don't remember your deliverance today, you probably weren't delivered. And there's three things about deliverance that, that, that we need to remember. And the first one is the day of our deliverance. I remember the day I got saved. I was, I was so deep and so lost in sin. Uh, my conscience would never let me rest. Drugs didn't help me. Alcohol didn't help me. Uh, a, a good marriage didn't help me. Uh, an expensive home didn't help me. The new truck I had didn't help me. Nothing would help me. And the more I lived and the more I prospered, the worse I felt. Because I knew deep in my heart that I wasn't right with God. And if you've been saved today, you should remember that day. You need to remember your deliverance. And here's what I mean by that. You need to remember what you were delivered from. Because here's what happened to the people. If you'll read through the book of Deuteronomy, you read through the, the Pentateuch in general, the people of Israel were delivered and God led them into the wilderness and God provided for them. And in the midst of God providing for them, they got bored with what God was giving them. And they began to whine and to complain and say, hey, at least when we were in Egypt, we had onions and leeks to mix in with our food. They began to remember the little things that meant nothing and had completely forgotten the bondage that had entrapped them. If you've been saved, you have been set free. Just like the first song they sang. I was bound with chains I could not get rid of. I tried. I tried to quit this and I tried to quit that. And when I would quit something, it still didn't bring relief. Sin had me bound. I was its slave. And if you've not been delivered today, you are a slave, whether you like it or not. You're a slave to the sin that controls you. And the Lord is telling us, don't forget what you were delivered from. Because if you do, you'll be like the Israelites and you'll begin to remember the little bit of good time and the little bit of, of fun time. And, well, you know, back, back before it was like this and, and I was able to... And, and you'll forget the bondage that you were in. I don't know that anybody here has ever been a slave in the sense that they were. It's been many years in America since anybody was beaten and truly enslaved and chained. But that's what they were living in. And sin had the same effect on me. There were things I did not want to do that I could not stop myself from doing because I was a slave. Sin had a control of me. And the Lord this morning is telling you, believer, not to glorify Satan. He deserves no glory. We do not give our testimony to glorify Satan and, and, or to give the impression that the sin we were bound in was fun or in some way enhanced our life because it did not. And we are never to forget what we were enslaved by. Because I guarantee you for the leeks and the onions that they remembered one day back in the slavery that they had previously been a part of, they would forget all about the leeks and the onions and beg God to deliver them again. I beg God to not let me forget what He delivered me from. Because temptation comes, the old man didn't die. The old man still wants to go out and play sometimes. And that's when I have to remember what I was delivered from. I have to remember that those nights, you know, the, the fun of the night was followed by a morning of sickness and regret. I have to remember that, you know, those, those fun times were followed by physical injury sometimes and mental lapses unable to remember what happened, who with, where, or, or anything else about it. And you live with fear. 
I can't forget that. Because the day I begin to forget what God delivered me from, I'll forget that God delivered me in the first place. And so one of the things that God wants us to not forget, over and over, if you'll go read the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to find that over and over, numerous times, the Lord tells them, do not forget that you were a slave in Egypt. Do not forget that you were a slave to sin. The day you start forgetting you were a slave to sin is the day you start forgetting you were a slave in the first place. And you may wander right back into it. So we cannot forget what God delivered us from. But the second thing we have to do is we have to remember we were a slave in Egypt so that we'll remember to give grace to those who are still enslaved. Look with me if you want to. You can flip or you can just listen. We're going to flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 15. And it says this, <clears throat> If thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. In other words, they're a slave. You now possess a slave. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock, and out of thy floor, and out of thy winepress, of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt bless him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee, therefore I command thee, do this thing. We are to remember that we were slaves, so that we'll remember to give grace to those still in slavery. I know there was a time I was very legalistic in my thinking. And I, I, I gave very little grace. And oh, look at Suzanne, she's already here. I was not a person who gave a lot of grace. I looked at people in the same prison that I had been in, but I looked down on them. I did not offer them grace. I condemned them. They were in the same prison I was in. They were the same slave I had been. How dare I forget to extend grace to a slave when I was a slave, if anybody should be able to give grace to the, to the enslaved, it's those who were enslaved before. Those who know the pain of slavery and the joy of freedom. And so this morning, church, we have to remember that we were slaves in Egypt. We were slaves to our sin so that we'll remember to give grace to those who are still enslaved. It's easy when somebody walks in here a slave to their addiction. They come in and they're dirty and they smell and we look at them and we say, oh, every dime they get they spend on something to shove into their veins or up their nose or whatever it may be. And it's easy to look down on them and it's easy to feel like turning them away and not giving them our heart or our attention. But the fact of the matter is they're just in the same prison that we were in. I remember many times being in that prison and wishing somebody would get me out. That somebody could help me. And so we have to remember this morning that we were slaves in the land of Egypt. We were slaves to our sin. And let's give grace to those who are still enslaved. They're not in control. They're a slave to their sin. Same as you and I were. And we cannot deliver them but we can give them grace and show them a God who can. And they may never find that God if we are not willing to extend grace in the first place. We have to remember our slavery so that we remember those still enslaved and to treat them with grace. The last thing we need to do is we need to remember our deliverance so that we may celebrate. In the very next chapter, in chapter 16, verse 12, it says this, and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt. Does that sound familiar? And thou shalt observe it to do these statutes. Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. After that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine, and thou shalt rejoice in thy feast. Church, it's okay to rejoice that we're no longer slaves. When Annie shouts, let her shout. Praise God, I wish God would give me a little shout once in a while. I guarantee you one thing about Annie. Annie remembers when she was a slave to sin. And she's glad she's not anymore. Amen? Josh talks about it all the time. 
Let's leave those new converts alone. When those new converts get excited about what happened, praise God, let them get excited. They still remember the slavery they were in. You know what I think the problem with a lot of us, me included, is it's been so long that we were a slave in Egypt that we forgot how bad it was and we forgot how to celebrate our freedom. And the only way to recover that is we got to go back. Not to wallow in self-pity. Not to give devil his due. But every once in a while, we got to go back and remember the slavery we were in so we can appreciate the freedom we have now. And it's okay to celebrate. It's okay to have a spiritual birthday party, amen? It's okay to get up and testify when God delivered you from drugs, when God delivered you from, from adultery, when God delivered you from whatever he delivered you from. It's okay to get up and testify about that. And God help us if we get tired of hearing your testimony. We need to remember our slavery so that we can remember how to celebrate. You know, one of the problems I have with the modern church is there's very little celebration anymore. Everybody's wallowing in self-pity. They want to hear songs over and over, and God bless those people who are going through a tough time. I've been through them. But the church in general, globally, seems to want to wallow in self-pity about poor me, poor me. I like the old hymns that celebrate, thank God I'm free. Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. I know somebody who'd get excited if we started singing that. Amen? We got to remember to celebrate, church. It can't always be sad if you serve Jesus Christ. If you've been delivered from the slavery of your sin, you ought to want to celebrate once in a while. We ought to get excited when we sing songs that celebrate our freedom because we have been set free from a lot. And when somebody celebrates a lot, just know this. The Bible says he who's forgiven much loves much. And you don't know what they were forgiven of, but bless God, they were delivered. Amen? So one of the things we need to do on this Memorial Day, taking a lesson from the book of Deuteronomy, is we need to remember our deliverance. If you haven't been delivered, you can be. Not by your choice or by your will, but when God calls, you can answer. And whatever it is that plagues you, you can be delivered. I'll tell you about something later that happened. But I remember the day God delivered me. It was amazing. I woke up the next day. Well, I, I went to work. And evidently, I cussed like a sailor. Who knew? In my slavery, I didn't realize it. I honestly had no idea that, that I was... Every fourth word was something foul out of my mouth. The night I finally got saved, I went to work, and about three days later, somebody at work said, man, what's wrong with you? What happened? I said, what are you talking about? They said, man, you cuss like a sailor. I haven't heard you say a cuss word in days. Now understand this. I didn't try to stop cussing at all. God changed who I was. The Bible says that when you're saved, you become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And one of the things that became new in my life was a filthy mouth. I just stopped cussing without thinking about it. I used to be in national sales. We had a lot of, we had a lot of uh, social gatherings. We had a social gathering not long after that, as we normally did. And I walked into a house, and for the first time I can remember... I looked at the beverage selection, and I just, I didn't have to resist. I just had no desire for the beverages they had. None at all. It was just gone. The desire was not there. I asked, do you have a Diet Coke? And they did. Fast forward a year later, every time we had a social gathering, they had all the normal beverages, and guess what? Everybody that had one started keeping in their refrigerator. You Diet Cokes because that's what I was drinking when I showed up. Amen? But I didn't try to do that. I didn't try to quit anything. God just changed my desires. God will change who you are if you will let Him. And this morning you can be set free from the slavery that binds you. The second thing we need to do is we need to remember God's dealings. 
in verses, uh, I believe it's 22, back to our original chapter. It says, The Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out thence that he might bring us and give us a new land, as he had commanded. We need to remember God's dealings. I won't be long on this, but there's, there's a couple of things that I think we need to see this morning, church. One of the things God did for the children of Israel that he told them not to forget was he defeated their enemies. Egypt was a, was a powerful enemy. And God showed signs and wonders and he took Egypt down. And he set his people free. One of the things he wants us to remember this morning is he's defeated our enemy. All the days of my life, I have an enemy in my soul. And when I was born, I immediately had an enemy. His name is Satan. And with him are death, hell, and the grave. But the Bible tells me in the New Testament that Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. He defeated my enemies. He set me free from them. And I'll just be honest with you, I'm not a super Christian. And there are times in my life where I come up against enemies. Human breathing enemies. They're not my brothers in Christ. They have another master. But I need to remember two things. I need to remember once that I was a slave in Egypt. And so are they. But I also need to remember that my enemy is not my problem. Anybody hear that? My enemy is not my problem. It's the Lord's battle. And one of the things we have to remember as Christians is that the Lord our God is capable of delivering us from our enemies. Whatever it may be, wherever they may come from, however big or small, the devil will try to intimidate you. He will try to make you cower in fear. He will try to make you disobey the Lord out of fear. But it's not your enemy to defeat. Take it to the Lord. Let him do wonders and signs in your life. The second thing they needed to remember is, and the Lord points this out later in the chapter, is that he had to humble them. I don't know if anybody else here has ever been to an old-fashioned woodshed, but when I was a boy, we still had some old-fashioned woodshed. And I had a few layers of skin whooped right off of me. And I don't know if any of you have ever been here, but God has a woodshed too, and I've been to it a couple of times. And that's a good thing. And God says, remember the times that I've had to humble you. Pride is a dangerous thing. It comes before a fall. The Lord gives grace to the humble. He gives not to the prideful. And so one of the things we need to remember is we need to remember those times in our life that God had to humble us. God had to teach us a lesson. Why would I want to remember that? So I don't have to go to the woodshed again. You see, I learned from my dad. When my dad got to two, it was time to stop. Because if he got to three, that was it. No more mercy, no more pleading. It was over. You were getting it. And I learned as a very young, young man that it was time to stop. To learn my lesson before I had to learn my lesson. Amen. God humbles us and he chastens us, but he does it in a spirit of love, the same as we do our children. And we are to remember those times that God humbles us so that we don't have to be chastened again. God's desire is the same as ours. If your desire when you punish your child is to harm them, then you are abusive and you need to have children removed from your home. If the desire of your heart when you punish your children is to change the direction of their behavior, then your desire is proper. God never chastens us out of anger or hate. He never gets mad at us and, and disciplines us out of anger. When God chastens a child, God chastens them to change the direction of their behavior. Amen? And we need to remember when God has humbled us so that we can change our behavior before we're punished again. And we need to remember God's provision. 
God has provided. There have been times in my life I've had plenty. There have been times in my life I've had little, but I've never wanted for what I needed. God provided the children of Israel for 40 years. The Bible says their clothes never wore out. The Bible says their food never ran out. They always had water in a, in a barren desert. God provided everything they needed. And God still provides for his children. Finally, we need to remember the destruction that can occur. If you look at chapter 8 in the book of Deuteronomy, beginning with verse 12, it says this, Lest when thou hast eaten and are full, and hast built goodly houses and dwell therein, and where, when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then, I, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee out from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And thou shalt say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Church, we have to remember this morning that destruction comes when we forget that God is the giver of all good things. If we're not careful, the greatest enemy we have is prosperity and wealth. God help those who preach a prosperity gospel. Does it mean that everybody should be poor? Absolutely not. God gives to who God wants to give to. But our prayer should be the same as it is in, in Scripture. God, give me what I need today. Don't give me too much or I'll get prideful and I'll forget you and I'll decide that it's by mine own hand that I've gotten all my wealth and all my good things and I don't need you anymore. And don't give me so little that I become a thief and profane the name of the Lord God in my stealing. Church, we have to remember this morning that destruction comes when we begin to forget that it is God who gives. If you can sing this morning, it is God who gave you the voice and He can take it away. If you have a strong back to build, God can take it away. If you have a million dollars in the bank, it can disappear overnight. God gives liberally where God will give. But we should never forget it is God who does the giving. It is a dangerous thing to wake up one day and look around and decide, look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I have done. Look at my home. Look at my car. Look at my children. If there's anything good in my children, it's because God will put it there in them. There is nothing I can do in this world that will be of any use or any good when I die. Nothing I can do is everlasting. If it has any value, if it has anything of merit, it is because God has given it to me. And we have to remember the destruction that can come when we begin to forget the God that delivered us, the God that gave us freedom from our slavery, the God who provided all of our needs. We have to remember that destruction is a very big reality for those who become prideful in the gifts that God has given them. The most dangerous enemy you will ever face in your life is prosperity. God must receive all the glory. I'll tell you one little testimony that goes along these lines. When I got saved, God delivered me from a lot of things, and I've told you about some of them. But I had one vice God did not deliver me from, and I could not understand it. For 20 years, I had chewed tobacco. And chewing tobacco has seven times more nicotine in it than a cigarette does. And I was bound. Chemically, physically, I was bound. After 20 years, I slept with it in. I ate with it in. I took a shower with it in. The only time I took it out was because it lost flavor so I could put a new one in. 
I started chewing it when it was 50 cents a can, and I quit when it was over three and a half bucks or something like that. And every time it went up a quarter, I said, I'm going to quit now. This is ridiculous pricing. But let me tell you something about being a slave to sin. You don't get to quit. You don't get to quit. And God changed everything in my life but that one vice. It had me. And every day from the day I got saved, I felt horrible. Every single day, I felt terrible about this filthy habit that had control of me. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed for God to deliver me and give me the strength to quit. Here was the problem in my prayer, the word quit. Because when, some, when you quit, who does the doing? You do. And who gets the glory? You do. <coughs> God led me along. And you can believe what I tell you if you want to. You can choose not to believe it. I'm telling you what happened in my life. I'm telling you about a God I serve, and you can hold a gun to my head and I'll not stop. And this is one of the reasons, one of the encounters that keeps God fresh in my, in my heart. My wife was dying. She had been put in a hospital room. They'd finally told her, it's over. We can't do anything else. You're going to die of your cancer. It's just that simple. And she was, they, we had gone in. It was the last time we went to the hospital. Uh, she had had some seizures, and we figured out it was the brain, the tumors had moved to her brain. And I have to be honest with you, most stressful time in my life. I have never been more stressed in all my life than to sit there and watch my wife for literally almost 72 hours. Neither one of us got to sleep. It was test after test after test after test. You get to the room about the time you're going to fall asleep. They come in. They want to draw this, poke that, shove that, get in the cart. We're taking you here. We're taking you there. And for nearly 72 hours, we got no sleep at all. And the bottom line was I was basically told, that's it. I can't tell you how stressed I was. Let me tell you, one of the things I needed when I was stressed more than anything was a big old fat lip of chewing tobacco. Well, what happened was after the tests were all done, we were in this great big room, uh, I think it was 6th or 7th floor at Wesley, all, all by ourselves, and we were finally alone, and they finally said no more tests. And she fell asleep in her bed, and I had not realized, because of my concern for her, I had not realized I had ran out of chewing tobacco like the day before. And it hit me all of a sudden, and I mean it hit me hard. I looked at her, she was asleep, and, the, and it dawned on me how desperately I needed my addiction. And I looked down at my hands, and they were just like this. If you've ever had an addiction, you know what this is. And you can't stop this. It's a physical reaction. I was shaking so hard I couldn't stand it. And I thought, you know what? She's been awake for almost 72 hours. She's been asleep for a long, long time. She's in the hospital. She's safe. There's a drugstore right across the street from Wesley Hospital. And I knew that I could get down there, get my fix, get back up to that hospital room. No problem. She'd never wake up and miss me. I got up out of my chair, and I started for the door, and I got about halfway across the room, and a voice, as audible as could be to me, said, where are you going? And I stopped, and I turned around, and I told my wife, I said, I'm sorry, but I haven't had any tobacco for, for, a, a, for, 20, for a whole day. It ran out yesterday. I'm going across the street to get some, and I stopped because it was at that point that I realized I was talking to nobody. She was still asleep sound asleep. It also dawned on me that the voice that I heard wasn't particularly female. And I kind of thought somebody's playing a joke on me through an intercom. So I got a, I turned around and I began to walk and when I got about halfway across the floor, the same voice says, where are you going? Why? So I stopped, and I just spoke to nobody in particular. I said, I'm going across the street to get me some chewing tobacco because I ran out. And the same voice in a very calm tone said, do you really need it? 
And I realized right at that moment that I wasn't shaking. I looked down at my hands, and they were steady. And I had no desire at all, none. I didn't want the taste. I didn't need the nicotine. I was free. And I answered in an audible voice, I might as well, you know, what? I said, no, I guess I really don't. The boy said, sit down, you'll never need it again. I haven't touched tobacco since. I tell you that to tell you this. It, it took me a long time to figure out why, why God. Now, I, I didn't tell you this. I had given up trying to quit. In desperation, my last prayer to God concerning it was, God, I can't quit. It's got me. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I can't quit. And if you don't just make it go away, it's just not going to happen. I'm done trying to quit. I'm sorry. I feel horrible, but this is just the way it's going to be. It wasn't until then that God healed me. And I wondered for a little while after that what happened that way, and then God brought it to my mind that he did it just that way for this reason. I have never told that story once and told anybody that I quit chewing tobacco because I did not. God delivered me from it. God gets all the glory. God gets all the credit. God delivered me from my vice. And don't you ever think that I was able to quit anything because I was not. I remember the destruction that can happen when you get prideful. And I don't ever want to forget it because I know that when you'll humble yourself before God, He'll do amazing things. So what do we do? We close with this. We've got to get practical, church. If you go back to the original scripture we read, look at what it says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Remembering God, remembering your deliverance, remembering his provision has to become who you are and not an intellectual exercise. It has to involve the heart, it has to involve the mind. It has to involve the body. It has to be something that you physically do, you mentally remember, and that you are emotionally attached to. You see, in all these verses, one of the things that we don't really get well in our language is, for the Hebrews, the word remember is tied to emotion. When God says, remember when you were a slave in Egypt, he isn't saying, you can check it off on the SAT exam that the Hebrews were slaves in the land of Egypt. He's saying, remember the pain. Remember the emotion, the anguish, the desire to be free. It's tied to emotion. When God says, remember your salvation, he doesn't, he doesn't mean you should be able to tell me, well, on this date I got saved and the Lord... God wants you to remember the release. He wants you to remember the breaking of the chains. He wants you to remember what it felt like, what it smelt like. He wants you to remember everything about it. It has to be tied to who you are. If you've never had that, now listen, everybody's not the same. Some people get saved and walk away calm on the outside and they're, they're blowing up inside. Some people cry uncontrollably. Some people laugh. But if something real didn't happen in your heart, if you never felt a release from the bondage that you were in, you must still be bound. When God says remember, he means remember with all that's in you. Remember the joy of serving the Lord. Remember the pain of being a slave. So we got to get practical. How do we do that? Well, some of the things that we're bad about not doing, we need to do. Remember, God said, remember my statutes. Bind them to your hand. Put them in your eyes. Put them on the doorposts of your house. Do not forget to keep my statutes. we got to get practical. If you want to not forget, you got to do some simple things like go to church once in a while. Going to church will remind you of who you once were and who you are now. Even showing up for Sunday school can help. Amen? 
God wants you to have a practical reading plan to work your way through his word so that he can talk to you. Because all the way through, you will be reminded of the slave that you once were and the deliverer who set you free. It's his love letter. God wants you to have a very real discipline of prayer. Don't talk to your wife or your husband for the next two weeks and see how that goes for you. I dare you. No, I don't, because then you'll be in in counseling and we'll have to talk about, no, don't get a divorce. But that's where about where it would head to. Our, 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 our relationship with God is just that. It's a relationship. You've got to make it a part of who you are. The Bible tells them back in the book of Numbers they, they, they were to put a blue fringe on their, on their garment so that every day, everywhere they went, every time they looked at what they were wearing, they would remember the statutes of God. And so we come up with little things. I don't care what it is. It's a little pocket cross. If it's a little ring or something, as long as it doesn't become an idol to you and as long as you have an emotional remembrance. I had one that wasn't related to God, but I'll give it to you real quick. When my first wife was alive, we went to Hawaii and we got, we got toe rings. Okay. It was fun. It was a surfing thing. We had toe rings. So we come back and the people in the church were getting a kick out of the toe ring on my foot. And she died. And I thought about taking that toe ring off. But every time I looked at it, I was reminded of regret. Don't ask me why, but I was. And I looked at that ring, and every time I saw it, I thought, you know what? Don't have any more regrets today. Don't regret the way you treated somebody. Don't regret something you said. Don't regret not saying something. There was an emotional attachment. And every time I looked at it, it reminded me. God's saying get practical. Get God in your life. Through his word, through prayer, through church. But he also said to put it on the doorpost of your house. Put it as a, bind it about your finger. Put it in your clothing. Whatever it takes, you need to make God a practical part of your everyday life. You need to remember your slavery. You need to remember your deliverance. You need to be willing to celebrate your freedom. You need to remember your chastening from God so that you don't have to be chastened again. Find something in your life that helps you to remember and to bond to that memory, to feel it again. Not just mentally, but emotionally, physically. You have to live it out so that you won't remember So this morning, it's real simple. God's asked us to remember some things. And he asked him to remember them for our own good. God desires one thing, to be number one in our lives. We remember those who were fallen today, but let me tell you something. My freedom wasn't free spiritually either. I had a Savior who paid a dear price so that I could be set free. And that's not something I want to celebrate once a year. It's not even something I want to celebrate once a week on a Sunday. It's something I need to celebrate on a regular basis. I need to remember every day of my life that I was a bondman in the land of Egypt, that Jesus paid a price. Jesus shed a light so that I could go free. Stand all over the room this morning, if you would. Singers, come. I don't know where you're at today, but God does. If you're here this morning and you've never had a release, if you are still a slave to your sin and you know it, today could be the day of your deliverance. Jesus died to set you free. He paid the price. It's a done battle. You just need to accept the winning side. If you're here this morning and you have forgotten the God who saved you, 
you've lost connection with the sin that you were once in and you've become unappreciative of what the Lord has done for you. He's not mad. He's not turning you away. He just requires and asks that you come back. That you take a moment to remember what He's done for you. Don't know the needs, but I know the altars are open, and I know we serve a God who hears. So this morning, if you have a need, if you just want to talk to God about where you've been in your remembrance, He's got an open ear. He hears, and He forgives, and He restores. Come this morning if you need to and use the altars.